Welcome. My name is Cindy Gay. I'm a rug hooking artist and teacher, and I teach rug hookers how to make the rugs of their dreams. Not just a copy of a picture of someone else's rug that they saw, but how to actually find their style and how to create their own rugs without relying on a photograph. And I do that through online lessons, classes like this, and online lessons that are a little bit more formalized and have many lessons in a row. You can join those at howtorugcook.com. Today's lesson is how to finish a pillow without doing it the hard way, okay? And the hard way, if you tuned in because you thought, oh good, she's gonna teach us the ladder stitch or something more involved like that. No, I'm, you're gonna be horribly disappointed. I am not teaching the ladder stitch or any other way as a trick to sew the backing of your pillow close to the hooking. And there's a reason I don't do that. And it's because I use the sashing method. And let's talk about why I use the sashing method. This is a pillow I call Jackson as a puppy. Um, I hooked it in September at Cape May, New Jersey. I hooked, I taught the first week and I was a student the second week. And we had just gotten Jack on Labor Day weekend. So we had had him for like two weeks. He was teeny tiny. He fit in the palm of your hand. He was only seven pounds. And I was worried that by the time I got home, he would be a grown boy and he would not know me. He would forget who I was, which none of that ever happened. I was home, real homesick for him. He was doing just fine with daddy, but I decided that I was going to hook this new puppy. And I wanted to fit, I didn't want to do a really big piece. So I finished it as a pillow. But note what I want you to notice is the sashing. And what I'm calling sashing is that blue fabric. That is flat fabric that has been sewn on. Okay, what's important about that is when this pillow is on a chair or on the couch, you see 100% of the hooking 100% of the time. It doesn't disappear and go down underneath in the seam. That's why I think the sashing method is superior. It reduces the amount of hooking you need to do for a certain size pillow but it also allows 100% of the hooking to show at all time. So let's take a look at this pillow. This was actually the first pillow I ever finished. It was a gift for my neighbor. Um, the name of this one is the house that Jack, the house that Frank built. And it was the first time I ever did a pillow. And what I ended up doing is I took a piece of fabric, this green herringbone that you see there, and I literally just cut out a rectangle that was the size of the hooking, laid that down and stitched it on with a fancy stitch from my sewing machine. Probably the only time I've ever used that fancy stitch on my sewing machine. But it was a horrible waste of fabric because I ended up with this small little rectangle that I couldn't do a whole lot with. It was really too short to hook with, um, but it was quick and it was fast. This was for Frank. He was moving to the United Emirates, which is where this pillow is today. It's across the ocean. And he had finished this house and he put his blood, sweat and tears in it. And I knew a hooking of the house would be something that he would want to have. So that's what I did, but I didn't start it until the morning of the housewarming. Okay, because I was planning on getting him something else and then that didn't turn out. But I was able to hook the house and finish it in time for the party. And you'll see why once I get going with how this works. This one is Samson. Um, Samson was our dog before Jackson. And Samson was golden retriever in Afghan and had something that was giving him seizures. Um, it could have been cancer, it could have been epilepsy. The doctor said we could do the diagnostic test, but it's not gonna change how we treat him. 
So it doesn't really matter what's causing it. Here you go. I learned how to use a phenobarbital suppository. Yes. On a convulsing dog, which was, that was like 65, 70 pounds. That was a whole experience in itself. But he had just had five seizures in three days. And that's why he looks so completely wiped out. I got down on the floor in front of him and took a picture and it broke my heart. And I wanted to hook that. I was in Elizabeth Black's class and that was the perfect image for that class. Well, he didn't have any more seizures after those five. And that was like late Saturday afternoon. So all day Sunday, we didn't do anything about it, but we had planned on Monday to take him to the vet because it was like, that's just too many seizures. This is too rough on him. So we were going to take him in and he didn't have any seizures on Monday and I didn't take him in. He ended up living three years after that with almost no seizures. It was almost like he had this huge storm all at once and then it went away. But again, the sashing allows it to, to view 100% of the hooking. If I didn't have that little bit of carpeting there and I didn't have the sashing and I stuffed this pillow a little bit on the oversized part, his nose would wrap around and go under the pillow and that would not be a good look. This is a, another pillow. This one was pretty early. I think this is the first one I did with this method. Um, this is called Rose with Monarch. It is a pattern that is available. It's a great pattern to use to learn how to shade. It's not that big. It's only like 14 by 14. Um, and it's got some of my favorite things. Um, a rose. I love roses. I love hydrangeas. And I love monarch butterflies. And it was really fun to hook. It's faded quite a bit. Um, this picture was taken right after it was hooked. It's faded a bit since then, um, but it is still one of my absolute favorite pieces. But again, notice how I don't lose anything on the bottom because of that sashing. So let's get into how it actually works. So this is obviously Rose with Monarch partially hooked. And this kind of illustrates a little bit of how I hook. I hook all over the place. I always get a lot of my background done before I get my motifs done. I'm using the jigsaw puzzle method, which I've talked about many times before. And it's just a wiggling all the way around and then it's a fill in, fill in, fill in kind of a thing. But I don't even have the leaf finished hooking. I got a whole bundle of hydrangeas that need to be hooked, but yet I'm making good progress on the background. You can see that the sashing is sewn on flat and I am hooking up to it. Okay, that's the secret. That was what makes it easy. Now hold that thought for a minute. Let's take a look at this piece, which is called Birches. This um, pattern would be available at, what's that called now? Um, honey beehive patterns. Um, it's an old House of Price pattern. And I hooked it using my birch bark wool, which was interesting because I developed the birch bark wool a year or two before. And when I, this was my junior year at Teacher's Workshop, the person who was teaching the class was a friend of mine. And she said, okay, this is gonna sound weird, but I wanna buy some of your birch wool so I can teach birches to your class. <laughs> so I ended up hooking with my own birch wool, it, you know, so it worked out great. It's easy. It looks like birches and it's virtually painless. It is so fast. It is so easy. Ding, done. It is, it, that's the, definitely the way to go. But when you finish or create the sashes on the piece like I did here, from there creating it and turning it into a tote bag as I did is very simple because it's normal sewing at that point. What I've learned since then, okay, so this tote bag has been through the washing machine twice um, and, and it's held up extremely well. It's hooked on rug warp. It's a small cut, threes, fours, um, all in wool and 
the, the lining of the tote bag got soiled. So I threw it in the washer. It didn't come out as clean as I wanted. So I pulled out the lining, not took it out, but just, you know, how it's loose on the inside of the bag, pulled it out and sprayed it with spray and wash and threw it in the washer again. And it came out much better. What I would do today is I would make the tote bag, I would finish this mat, and then I would simply tack the mat on. Um, that's just one of those things that I've learned since then, and I would definitely be doing it that way instead. Another thing that you can do with this method is create a finish. So let me show you on here. Here is that piece, and I'm sorry, the lighting's really crappy because we've got that storm coming through. But here's the piece. It was always going to be just a teaching piece. And the backing, the hooking ends where my thumbs are, and the backing just comes all the way out to the edge. I've heard people in Canada refer to this as a show finish. I don't know the history of why they call it a show finish. I've heard it called a flat finish but you could finish a rug this way. It's not gonna be the most super long lasting. I think a whipped edge is gonna be a little bit more durable, but what the heck, this is gonna last a while. It is wool after all, right? And then that piece of wool that you put on as the sashing is simply brought around to the back and stitched and stitched down. Okay, so Let's work through the process of how to do this. Okay. With the sashing, there's a couple of different ways you can go. You can go, oh, there's a typo in that. Um, you can do a sashing with a miter joint, or you can do a sashing with a butt joint. Okay. Quite frankly, I don't know if you <coughs> noticed some jewel. I don't know if you noticed the joints when I was showing you different um, items, but you really don't notice the difference. And from now on, I am doing everything with the butt joint. It's a little bit easier. I find that the miter joint, it can distort the edge a little bit. It can come unstitched because there's hand stitching involved, it takes longer. Um, but that's your decision on what side, how you want to do that particular thing. So let's talk about how you would actually go about getting ready to put the sashing on. So you have the hooked area and then you have the future final edge, meaning you're going to continue hooking out to this future final edge. You just haven't gotten there yet, okay? The picture in the example is bound, and if you got good eyesight, you can see that. Ignore that for now. At the time I put this together, I didn't have something that was hooked and un unbound, okay? So pretend that it's not bound, okay? You're gonna hook it out to this future final edge. From there, you gotta mark out a seam allowance and I'll show you what that's for in just a minute. So for right now, let's go back to this piece here and imagine that this is our hooking. You can do it at this stage when it's brand new or you can wait until you have some of it hooked. It's totally up to you. Sometimes you don't know that it's going to be a pillow until you have some of it hooked and then you go, oh, this would make a good pillow. So, but this is where I intend to finish the hooking. This is where the last of that hooking will be. So what I need to do is I need to take, and I was playing around with lighting. I'm not sure which one what color is gonna show up best. The lighting was changing quite a bit as I was getting, it's way too dark. Let me work on this one. I think you can see this and it doesn't get too dark. We need to take this wool and sew it in such a way that it lines up with this particular edge, right? So what I wanna do is go through and put my pencil through the corners. You only need to do two because when you turn it over, 
you can see the two holes. And I am just going to zip and zip, zip and zip. So now what I've done is I've in effect taken that line from the other side and transferred it to this side perfectly. This is actually going to be my stitching line. This is where I'm actually going to be stitching. On this side, where the hooking is going to be, or you know, will be, I am going to determine a seam allowance. And seam allowance can be whatever you want. I'm going to do about a half inch seam allowance. So like that. And if you get it a little bit off, no problem. Just redraw it. Then I'm going to take my wool strip and I am going to line it up with that seam allowance. Because remember, where I'm going to be sewing it is way back here. But I can't see that line. So I need the seam allowance line so that I can line the wool up with it. And when in doubt, leave plenty of extra. Okay? I usually leave at least as wide as the sash is. And I'll do it that way. And then I can go here, fold it like that, and know that I can cut it here. Okay, does that make sense? Then you're going to pin it. Uh, this is nothing fancy. But what's important is where I want to sew it is on this side. Because I can see the actual perfectly straight line. Now, if I'm sewing this by hand, I don't have to do anything. I can just start sewing right there. If I'm sewing it with a machine, you do not want pins on the back, right? So I simply pin it again, and then come over here, take those out. I can now take this to the sewing machine, and I can stitch right on that line. Easy peasy, right? When you're ready to do the next side, it's going to be the same thing. And one way to know that you're laying this down right is that the bulk of the wool should be covering up your hooking. Because if you put it this way and then you fold it, that's wrong, right? So you want it to cover up most of the hooking. If I'm doing a butt edge, I always do one side like this, and then I go directly across to the other side, and I'll do the second side. Then once it is stitched down, I'll fold it back like that, and then come in with the second piece, and lay it down like this and pin it. I'm going to do this one just so that you can see the difference between the two sides, kind of. And then repin it on this side because we're going to take the other pins out or it's going to gum up our sewing machine, right? And then what I'm going to do because I'm doing a butt edge, I'm going to extend, I'm going to extend this line out a little bit further. And I'll do the same thing over here. And then I will stitch from here all the way down. And what will happen then is that when I flip this over, it'll now sew these two together. Does that make sense? How wide? should the strip of wool be for the sashing? I use my 16th of a yard. So that is about three inches. So on my website, you can buy a 16th of a yard strip and that's always worked perfectly for me. It doesn't have any waste. I just pop that on there and away I go. Now, if you were to do a miter joint, your stitching is going to end at a corner. And then what you're going to have to do is fold these back and under and then stitch it together by hand. I haven't figured out a way to do that with the sewing machine. 
So that takes um, more time. You can get that angle off and it's gonna look messier than a butt joint. Um, so I, I avoid doing it. I literally just do butt edges. Now the other thing you wanna really consider and pre-plan, maybe even before you draw your pattern, is using something like this because you're going to want the plaids to match up somehow and if you're not a seamstress who's experienced at matching up plaids don't do this okay if you are it's a cool look it looks perfect but if you're not experienced at doing that don't try it um choose something that's a little bit of a solid um you know or, or something that's got an overall texture rather than a print with a repeat to it. So that looks like that's all the questions for how to make a pillow. If you liked this lesson and you want to see other lessons that are like this, there are many, many, many of them inside the Rug Cooking Journey. Just go to howtorugcook.com and you can join that program there.